Yeah, so before I get into the conversation about uh, the Vision Zero Road Safety Plan, I thought I'd put things in a little bit of context, um, and in parallel with that, I'll put a bit of a shameless plug in for the presentation you guys are going to see this afternoon from uh, the city's chief planner. Um, the Vision Zero Road Safety Plan really, really focuses on the operational context with respect to road safety. Um, whereas, as many of you can appreciate, um, you know, if you're really trying to, to solve or resolve a complex problem like you know, traffic-related fatalities in a city, um, you've got the operational side, but you've also got the planning side. It's, almost, it's about trying to see if you can't really deal with the problem sort of from the get-go and making sure that we plan our cities in a manner where we don't inherently create um, safety-related problems in that context. Whereas the Vision Zero Road Safety Plan really deals with the problems that we have that are ongoing right now uh, within our communities with respect to high-risk um, you know, areas for our collisions. So, so here's where our story begins. Um, this slide here gives some sort of general stats on the city of Toronto, and if I could sum it up in a nutshell, the city of Toronto is a very big city. Um, about 2.8 million people calling Toronto home. You've got about 3 million people who are basically moving in and around the city every day. Um, we have about 2,300 traffic signals in the city, about 1 million traffic signs. So suffice to say from this that, um, you know, when you're talking about road safety in the city of Toronto, it's a very large and complex problem. And you can kind of understand, uh, for those of you who looked into the road safety plan, why it is that we felt the need to really kind of break it down into its various elements and pieces to really kind of tackle the problem of road safety. In addition to that, in terms of understanding the lay of the land, um, this, this uh, image here basically shows the city of Toronto in the context of modal split. You can kind of see from there in the downtown core, Toronto East York. In terms of modal split, it's relatively even between about 31% all the way up to about 37% in terms of people who either walk or bike or drive or take transit in around the city. When you get to the suburbs area, not so much. And again, it's, it's a very important kind of uh, thing to recognize when you're dealing with road safety in a city like this, the, the variances and the nuances, especially when you start talking about the fact that um, a lot of the people in the suburbs basically commute to the downtown core. And the lay of the land in the suburbs is very different than that of the downtown core. And, uh, and, and so as a result, it's very, very critical to sort of uh, take that into consideration as well too. Now, when you look at uh, collisions overall in the city of Toronto, and again, uh, this is not something I like to sort of boast and brag about, but generally we experience anywhere from about 50,000 to about 70,000 collisions a year. And generally speaking, I'd say from about 1980 all the way through to about now, the number of collisions in the city of Toronto has remained relatively constant. That being said, if you take into consideration things like, um, you know, vehicle miles traveled, increases in population, all those types of things, depending on how you want to normalize that, you could actually argue that it's kind of trending down in terms of collisions. On the flip side, if you look uh, at this, this diagram I have here, specifically in the context of, tra of traffic fatalities, especially over the past, I'll say, from about 2011 onward, we've, we've basically been seeing this upward trend. Uh, it's a negative trend that, uh, that we basically want to uh, really, really focus in on. And more than that is, uh, in terms of the traffic fatalities, I've actually shown it here broken down by mode. And that sort of uh, salmon-y color, uh, sort of salmon color, sort of uh, reddish section there in the middle, basically represents the pedestrian fatalities. So you can see why it is that we, you know, it, it makes up such a significant proportion of the traffic-related fatalities in Toronto. Below that, you've got the light gray and the, and the light blue as well, too, which basically represents cyclists and motorcyclists. So really, if you look at it, um, vulnerable road users have made up roughly about 74% of all traffic-related fatalities in Toronto over the past, I'll say, five, maybe even 10 years kind of thing. And hence the reason why we've been adopting a philosophy of Vision Zero with a very heavy focus towards the vulnerable road users. So the road safety plan itself is uh, it's a five-year, $80 million plan. Um, it's not a high-level, you know, sort of policy document. It's a concrete, solid plan of capital improvements and operational enhancements within this program. Uh, there are 45 countermeasures, and I'll talk specifically about some of the countermeasures a little bit later on in my presentation. But the 45 countermeasures are complete, full-on programs. This is a very, very serious, uh, you know, commitment that we made to improving road safety within the City of Toronto. And I'm very proud to say, and it's, uh, I'll be in a very difficult task, it was uh, unanimously approved by council back in July of last year. Um, so again, sending the message to city staff that uh, also from a political perspective, we have a very, very strong will to adopt uh, this philosophy. 
Um, myself and my staff didn't quite go into a dark corner and build this plan. It was very much a collaborative effort. In fact, there are about 12 agencies, many of which I actually see in this room <laughs> right now, who are very heavily involved in helping us to develop this plan. Um, we started, I'll say it was around November of 2015, and we wrapped up around June of uh, 2016, where we met together on a monthly basis, basically brainstorming and collaborating on all sorts of ideas and innovative concepts that we could basically use to filter into the development of this plan. The, uh, so the plan was unanimously approved by council back in July of last year. However, because of our budget cycles, the, the plan doesn't officially take effect in, until January 1 of this year. Um, so on January 10th, we had our official, I'll say, kickoff uh, you know, ceremony where we've had uh, the mayor, you can see here, Mayor Tory, uh, Chief uh, Mark Saunders as well, um, our chair of the Public Works Committee, all basically standing side by side in unison and committing to the Vision Zero philosophy of that no loss of life is acceptable. And we also baked in the concept of Vision Zero being the key to ensuring a sustainable city. So our vision is really eliminating traffic-related deaths and serious injuries on Toronto roads. And so then the next question is, well, how do you go about doing that? Well, there's basically six uh, areas that we're really, really heavily focusing on to deliver on this. Um, the engineering, it's the, you got your three E's. There's engineering safety measures, educational safety measures, as well as enforcement activities. But above and beyond that, we're also looking to technology. Um, we've got our red light camera program, and now recently the province of Ontario just approved uh, or passed legislation, rather, with respect to automated speed enforcement to bring it back into Ontario. Um, so I'm going to be talking, as he mentioned before, I'm going to be talking a little bit more about that uh, in my uh, presentation tomorrow. Um, obviously, also very big pieces of this uh, pertain to the evaluation side of things. It's a significant program, and we really, really do have to look at um, how are we going to go about evaluating these things. Idealistically speaking, you'd like to look at collisions, uh, but, but as many of you know in this room, you really have to look at the long-term trends in terms of collisions. So from an evaluation perspective, we're working on right now a strategy where we're looking at evaluating the causal factors behind um, the collisions. So for example, if speeding is an issue, then we're going to measure speeding before and after. We're also going to be looking at near-miss analysis as well, too. Um, we've learned some of that from some of the other jurisdictions here, actually in Canada, in terms of that, are, uh, that have adopted Vision Zero, and sort of following their lead in some respects and, and taking leadership as well in our, in our own rights. And then certainly in terms of engagement activities, we are planning on working with the communities, working with the city councillors to really engage the communities and, and get a, a more in-depth understanding of what's really going on in those neighbourhoods so we can get to the key point of the problems that exist. So within the road safety plan, as I mentioned earlier, being a large and complex problem, it, it was very, very important for us to break it down into its various elements. Fundamentally, we, we developed these as, as emphasis areas. So there's six key areas that we want to improve road safety for. Pedestrians, school children, older adults, and, and actually, I'll just stop there for a minute. Um, if you remember from my slide just a couple slides ago there, I was showing on that graph about how pedestrians make up such a significant proportion of the traffic-related fatalities. But right off the top there, you can see about half of the emphasis areas within the road safety plan all specifically deal with pedestrians, whether it's pedestrians at large, school children, or older adults. We also have cyclists and motorcyclists, which also make up that 74% that I talked about. But last, and certainly not least, is this whole concept of aggressive driving and distraction. I can't emphasize enough how much in the city of Toronto that plays itself as sort of the backdrop um, to a lot of the problems that we actually experience in Toronto in terms of collisions. Um, oftentimes, uh, you know, you have a situation where a vulnerable road user has been hit, and it, it's, you know, in large part to either the driver being aggressive, they were, maybe they were stuck in, stuck, in, stuck, stuck, I should say, in traffic, apologies, <laughs> and then they're diverting off a side street and not inadvertently realizing they're going through a school zone you know, kind of idea. Or maybe they're going down the street and someone's, you know, walking out mid-block where you wouldn't expect it. Um, again, maybe the motorist would have had the time to stop had they not been distracted, looking down at their phone or, or, or any other type of distraction. So aggressive driving and distraction is, is, is likewise a very critical um, emphasis area within our road safety plan. So I'm just going to talk very briefly about data analysis and prioritization. And, and again, in a city as large as, uh, as Toronto and, and complex as Toronto, it, we found it was very, very important for us to, to come up with a, with a strategy in terms of how do we go about prioritizing the deployments. Fundamentally, from a Vision Zero perspective, as you guys all know, I mean, the idea would be that if you know something is, is bound to improve safety, let's say, for example, no right turn on red or speed reductions, you should be systematically doing that across the city. 
Well, in a city as, as large as Toronto, to do something like that, um, and I can give an example. Um, I'll say about three years ago, we adopted a philosophy of increasing pedestrian walk times. Our typical walk speed was set to about 1.2 meters per second, and we said, well, you know what, from a safety perspective, let's reduce that down to one meter per second, which, depending on the width of the intersection, as you guys all know, can add anywhere from two to three seconds in terms of walk speed to that. We started going about that in a systematic manner. It's taken us about three years. You know, I'm proud to say we're about nearly 80% done, but there's still the odd complaint from the public saying, well, the pedestrian walk time over here, the pedestrian walk time over here, and we just hadn't gotten to it yet. But this is the whole thing. This is why it's so important for us now moving forward in terms of Vision Zero that we prioritize our strategies rather than taking this kind of systematic approach across the city because you're always going to be missing out those critical elements. So from that regard here, as you can see on my diagram, so this is basically a collision density map. We're showing um, the red spots basically indicate locations where we've had four or more, we call them KSI collisions or killed or seriously injured collisions. Uh, moving all the way back to the blue, where you've got about maybe one um, you know, fatality or serious injury collision in that area. And we basically kind of um, you know, expanded the density around each one of those dots to represent kind of, we'll say, sort of our zo intended zone of influence. So in doing so, we basically created this heat map that becomes kind of our marching orders. We can literally box off each one of those blobs on the map and say, this is an area that we're going to basically target within our program. We can then pull the specific motor vehicle accident reports pertaining to that area and really drill down and see what things we can do in terms of road safety uh, uh, improvements. So then I'll say the nice thing as a practitioner from taking this KSI collision approach is you can see that there's a nice finite number of dots. It's not like an insurmountable problem now in terms of this um, to, to sort of tackle this. And this basically makes up pretty much of our 2017 and 2018 program moving forward. However, uh, we also have this tremendous wealth of data in terms of collision data, which again, you know, if I were to give order of magnitude, KSI collisions would be on the order of maybe three or 400 a year in Toronto versus the 50 to 70,000 collisions overall, which we definitely don't want to ignore. So in subsequent years, we're basically gonna start looking at collisions overall, using the TAC approach in terms of PSI and network screening, which I'm sure many of you guys are familiar with, which, as you can imagine, we'll basically put a lot more dots on this map right, in doing so. So it's kind of like a sieve, and we're basically opening up the dots and identifying more locations from there. Now, at the end of the day, and this is the last uh, piece I want to sort of speak to, is uh, my point number three in terms of the causal factors. As you can see on the map, there's a number of areas on there that show basically white space. Uh, and you can imagine that there may be say the public or city councilors complaining, saying, so on one hand, um, I don't see any collisions or fatalities happening in, in my area. On the other hand, I know that there's aggressive driving issues. I know that these are these problems and so on and so forth. So what we've done is we've recently started a new process and we're working very closely with Toronto Police Service in this regard with respect to fatal collision reviews. And the root of, these, of, the, of the purpose of these meetings that we have is to try and see if we can't determine the root cause, the causal factors behind these. What are the factors, the recipes for disaster, I'll say, that contribute to those uh, fatalities and serious injuries within those neighborhoods? And once we've got that, we then have the ability to address, I'll say, the white space on this map to say, you know, if this neighborhood has all these causal factors attributed to it, we're not gonna wait until the fatalities or serious injuries happen there. We're just gonna program that as part of our plan moving forward. So now I'm gonna talk about um, the, the, those 45 countermeasures. I'm not gonna go through all 45 countermeasures, but just wanna give you an example of the order of magnitude of these, uh, of these programs as I kinda go through it. So for the first emphasis area in terms of pedestrians, and uh, for each of these uh, emphasis areas, I'm gonna go through the same sort of format where you can see you know, how we've uh, we basically parsed the data. You can see here the, the, or the dark orange at the bottom basically represents fatalities. Lighter orange basically represents serious injuries. And you can see that recent uptick with respect to pedestrian fatalities. And likewise, with the mapping, uh, albeit it's a little bit hard to see the map I've got tucked in the corner there, but you can imagine that we've basically done mapping for each one of the, the uh, emphasis areas as well too. So we can really, really kind of target each problem uh, in, its, in its entirety. Within the, uh, the pedestrians um, emphasis area, uh, we have the, the, the kind of signature program, I'll say, is what we refer to as pedestrian safety zones. So if we develop that map and we identify areas or quarters where we see a number of KSI collisions, we basically box off that area and say, this is going to be a pedestrian safety uh, zone. And within the pedestrian safety zone, we undertake things like geometric safety improvements, um, APS accessible pedestrian signals, um, speed reductions. We do walkability audits to identify issues with sidewalks. Um, so there's all kinds of things that basically, tools I'll say, that fit into this one toolbox of what we would do within an area that's been designated as a pedestrian safety zone. 
question. Uh, now, for the school children emphasis area, um, you know, over the past few years, you can see here, I mean, the dark green basically representing fatalities. Um, you know, I'm, it's very fortunate to say that there's been a number of years where we had zero um, school age fatalities in the city of Toronto. However, this year in particular, um, it, it's very unfortunate for me to say there's actually been two so far um, school age fatalities in Toronto. Um, so it's really, really kind of put this, uh, you know, on the radar and high on a, on a number of people's agendas as well, too. Um, I think just recently, uh, our school board, um, the trustees had basically passed a motion where they're going to be uh, now working very, very concertedly with us in terms of the Vision Zero Road Safety Plan. We'd always been working together with a plan, and we basically had sort of the elements in terms of how we want to work with the schools in that regard. But now it's a case where we've got that support from the top down. And really, in our discussions with the school boards, we've kind of broken it off into three separate pieces. The one element is on school property itself in terms of improving safety, um, you know, in terms of all the interactions with vehicles parking, the buses dropping off kids for school, all these types of things. But those plans invariably push uh, the, the parents and the traffic of people sort of dropping off kids to the frontage of the school. So this is where we come up with this idea of the school safety zone. And we're thinking roughly about maybe a 500 meter radius of the school, not so much linear as radius, because again, depending on where the school is, we're going to be deploying all kinds of, of uh, specific safety measures within that kind of frontage of the school, that area where parents are dropping off and picking up kids. But in parallel with that, it's also an area where people are trying to scoot through with respect to traffic. And then above and beyond the school safety zone concept, we're going to be working with the schools boards as well too in terms of active and safe routes to school. You know, working with the communities, identifying what are those safe routes to school and what extra elements can we do to supplement in those areas to improve uh, that aspect of things as well too. So just uh, rattling off a few of some of the examples of what goes into a school safety zone. We're going to be looking at rapid flashing beacons, school stencils, uh, watch your speed driver feedback signs. Um, we're looking at designating these as a community safety zone. So in, in, in the Ontario context, that basically means that the speed fines could be doubled. But more than that is with the province's new legislation, that also means that we could theoretically be putting um, a speed enforcement camera within the area. Uh, and again, there's the province's definition of a school safety zone, of a school zone, I should say, which is I think about 300 meters up and downstream. With the community safety zones, we have the capability of expanding that and giving us further reach in terms of where we could theoretically be deploying these speed cameras. Looking at speed reductions and looking at the possibility of increased pedestrian walk times, advanced screen for pedestrians. So there's all kinds of different tools that we'd be throwing, uh, that we'd be looking at uh, implementing within what we define as the school safety zones. In terms of uh, older adults, um, and again, this is one of the things that when we're going through the data, um, you know, and slicing and dicing in so many different ways, one of the things that really, really jumped out at us in terms of the issues within the city of Toronto is the alarming amount of traffic-related fatalities that deal with senior citizens. Um, in terms of senior citizens within the city of Toronto, we about 67% of, of all pedestrian fatalities are attributed to seniors. And if you kind of lower the bar a bit to, to the category, say here, of older adults, which is basically 55 and older, that number jumps up to about 86, almost 87% of all pedestrian fatalities being older adults. So again, a very, very uh, critical issue here within the city of Toronto. We have an aging population, and a significant proportion of them are being subjected to this. And again, looking at the trend, you could see in the terms of the dark purple, this upward trend that we've been seeing. Um, so, out of the gate, um, again, the plan didn't officially get started in January, but we were literally talking about this in December, um, was this whole idea of developing senior safety zones. So essentially what we did was we mapped where are all the senior fatalities happening within the city of Toronto against data that we got from city planning in terms of where do the seniors live, where do they interact, and where you've got a match in terms of those boxes, these are the areas that we basically made our very first level in terms of high priority. These are sort of like the low-hanging fruit. And as I mentioned beforehand, we're going to continue to identify more and more locations around the city and changing our criteria up to basically open up that sieve, if you will, in terms of that. So once an area has been designated as a senior safety zone, um, there's a couple of key signature uh, safety measures that we implement within that zone. Um, we have this new safety uh, zone signs that basically sort of designate the beginning and end of a senior safety zone. 
uh, water speed driver feedback signs, enhanced pavement markings on the side streets, um, increased pedestrian walk times, advanced green for pedestrians, um, looking at the possibility of reducing speeds. Again, uh, you see community safety zones, and again, with full intent that uh, in the future this would mean we'd have the ability to implement speed enforcement within these senior safety zones. There's all kinds of different safety measures that would basically go into each of these senior safety zones depending on the lay of the land within each location. Uh, our emphasis area number four in terms of cyclists, um, as you can see the, the dark yellow at the bottom basically represents uh, the cyclist fatalities. Uh, I'm very proud to say with respect to this that, um, you know, the numbers are low, but of course this is vision zero and the intent is to see zero, right, at the end of the day. Um, that being said, if I were to wind the clock back on this graph a bit, um, as many of you know in this room, one of the single most powerful um, countermeasures with respect to cycling safety is the idea of taking cyclists out of mixed traffic. And so for so many years prior to this graph, we've been going through this process of adding multi-use trails, adding cycle tracks in and around the city, and that has had a tremendous effect in terms of taking this from the double digits down to the single digits. Uh, that being uh, said, uh, I'm also very proud to, to say that last year, just prior to the road safety plan being approved, uh, in June, uh, the 10-year cycling infrastructure plan was approved uh, by council, and we're very avidly going through the process of that right now. It was dealt with as an independent, but fundamentally, it's all under the big umbrella of, of Vision Zero. And so here, I'm just sort of talking about uh, some of the implementations that we're starting here in, uh, in 2017 with respect to that. But there are a number of other countermeasures as well, too, pertaining to, uh, to cyclists as well. Now, in terms of uh, motorcyclists, um, the interesting thing with this particular emphasis area is there's a lot of uh, mental bias with respect to this particular group. Um, you know, there's a stereotype of motorcyclists being those guys with the handlebar mustaches who, you know, the weekend warrior types kind of thing, right? Um, but in the city of Toronto, I'll say over the past 10, maybe even 15, 20 years, there's been a, a, a huge shift in terms of uh, who the motorcycling population is. These are people who basically are commuting to and from work uh, and using the motorcycle as their mode of choice. Um, these are people who, uh, you know, and this is again talking to organizations like Rider Training Institute, which educate many of the motorcyclists in Ontario, um, where many of them have never driven a car before. It's like the motorcyclist is their first thing. And so, again, that dynamic when they're educating them in terms of, you know, cars can't see you when you do this, and cars can't, you know, don't have the ability to maneuver in this kind of manner are very key and critical factors that we have to take into consideration. So one of the ideas that we came up with with respect to the motorcyclists, and again, this is working with uh, the, the Motorcycle Training Institute, who has a lot of experience in dealing with educating motorcyclists, is this idea of adding dedicated signs to the road uh, for motorcyclists, motorcyclist advisory signs. And kind of along the same lines, I mean, this idea that motorcyclists do have a different dynamic from cars or trucks or buses, uh, the key dynamic difference in terms of how they operate is they have the ability to accelerate on a dime. And, and again, there's a little bit of a, a thrill element to it. You know, you're coming around a bend, you're making a turn, and the motorcyclist doesn't realize there's a traffic signal ahead, and they hit the gas, and they boot around the corner kind of thing. Um, so the key message we've been getting from them is it's important to basically put these signs up. Now, the key thing as well is, remember I mentioned earlier about the three E's and the importance of basically balancing between your engineering and education and enforcement. So we didn't just go and put these signs up. We're also very, we're working very closely with Rider Training Institute in terms of educating the motorcyclists with respect to these signs so they know what it means and, and to get that conscientious message out to them that when you see this, you know, this is your cue, your visual cue to slow down, don't gun it around the bend, follow what the sign says. These signs are specifically directed towards you. So this is a perfect example of one of the many countermeasures where you see that balance between the education, uh, I mean the engineering measure as well as the education kind of working hand in hand together. And then lastly, as I mentioned, aggressive driving and distraction. And for those of you who have been paying attention to the order of magnitude of my previous graphs, you can kind of see what I mean uh, in terms of how everything's kind of shot up here when we talk about aggressive driving and distraction, and this being kind of the backdrop to everything. So in terms of aggressive driving and distraction, um, we've got the mobile watch of speed program, we've got a red light camera program. I, I think the key thing though that I really want to tout is a new program that we're doing with uh, Toronto Police Service with respect to data-driven enforcement. 
So we're working with the police to basically identify the key hotspots around the area. They're going to be targeting those areas to be doing blitzes. And in one concerted effort, the combination of, you know, you know, this is what the collision history is like in this neighborhood. These are the number of fatalities and serious injuries we've had in this neighborhood. Telling the public, you know, through the media, this is why we're here today. We're doing this enforcement. We're targeting these specific dangerous driving behaviors. And in parallel with that, Transportation Services has, has got this whole slew of engineering improvements that are on their way. So that combination of the enforcement, um, you know, to reinforce the, the, the idea, the education piece, telling the public through the media why we're doing this, and the engineering measures basically following. So people are more apt to sort of follow uh, when we make those implementations. As I mentioned before about the automated speed enforcement as a future implementation, and we're also going to be working on a new educational campaign, probably about Q3, Q4 of this year, specifically targeting uh, driver distraction, um, pedestrian distraction, and, uh, and aggressive driving overall. So just in wrapping up some of the key lessons learned um, since we started, now mind you, we are still... I keep boasting this, we're still relatively speaking fresh out of the starting gate, we just started in January, but even going through the whole process of developing the plan, there's a number of key things that we've kind of learned. In fact, three things that uh, I really want to impart upon you. Um, one of them is I, I emphasize to all of you, to, you know, as you're embarking on these types of road safety plans, to be data-driven. Um, I don't think the city of Toronto is exclusive relative to other cities in this regard, but uh, there's a lot of anecdotal impressions about what the problems are within the city. Whereas you need to shift the conversation and start talking in the context of the data. What are the real problems that the city is experiencing and how do we go about targeting specifically those problems? And again, trying not to make decisions based on anecdotal information, always use the data to kind of help in terms of driving you in that regard. The second thing that we learned in developing the plan and getting to this point is to be more strategic than we are opportunistic. Um, a lot of jurisdictions in terms of road safety, you know, you've got an ongoing or proposed road reconstruction project. It's maybe not the highest on the list, but, you know, you're going to invest your money there because it's going to happen anyways to do those safety improvements. Well, now what we're doing is we're working on being much more strategic and saying, based on the data, these are the high-risk intersections, these are the dangerous driving behaviors we're seeing, these are the engineering improvements that need to move forward, and we're not waiting for a road reconstruction project to come along. We're, we're basically taking that and making that a priority, and quite frankly, even shifting priority in that regard if need be. And then lastly, leveraging existing programs. I love that, um, sorry, I didn't mean to do that plug for Scotiabank. I love that comment. <laughs> You're richer than you think. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, within the city of Toronto, we've always been uh, investing in road safety. Um, you know, we typically spend about $41 million a year in terms of road safety already. So the road safety plan basically represents a $16 million per year cap on top of that. So it's kind of going above and beyond what we typically and traditionally do in terms of road safety. But then even leveraging that $41 million. So in terms of the things we typically do, we're now putting that prioritization into the mix. So really, it is a complete bundled program of almost, I think it's quoted $150 million now, when you put the whole thing together uh, in terms of the money that was spent before in the past and continues to be spent in addition to the capped uh, money uh, that's going towards the program as well, too. So on that note, I'll open the floor to any questions you guys have. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. There are mics here if people would like to uh, pose their questions. Uh, when pedestrians get hit, uh, people typically think it's those darn dangerous drivers out there. But earlier research has suggested that drivers and pedestrians are equally at fault. Do you have statistics on that for Toronto? Yeah. Actually, we've done a number of queries. Um, and this is the one thing. We are working with Toronto Police Service right now in terms of the possibility of getting data out through open data. And I think we're very, very much eminent, like hopefully in the next few weeks, that the police will have their open data portal out there, that basically the whole community will have the ability to basically look at the data and do just that. One of the dangers of the data is that if you just run a straight query and say, for example, pedestrians at fault, um, you will see a significant number of ticks saying pedestrians at fault. And it kind of goes without saying to some extent, because within the Highway Traffic Act, um, you're allowed to cross mid-block provided that there's a safe gap. Well, by default, if you got hit by a car, <laughs> you can kind of argue that, right? In parallel with that, though, I would also argue that you do see a lot of, of uh, the same reports saying that aggressive driving speeding was involved, or distraction may be involved, or impaired driving may be involved. 
So at the end of the day, um, it really is a case of a shared responsibility, and we need to communicate that around our, our population. You know, pedestrians on one hand, um, if you want to be looking down your phone and texting while you're crossing the street, be wary of the fact that cars, drivers may be distracted, you know, kind of, like, or they may be speeding because they just found a breakaway from the congestion they were just in. And likewise, uh, for, for drivers, um, you know, you have to go on the assumption that pedestrians are always looking for the shortest way, play, way to get to where they want to go. And you can't always assume, in fact, um, I showed that earlier image of the modal splits around Toronto and the fact that, you know, when you go out to the suburbs, you barely see pedestrians walking in around the sidewalks. When you go to the downtown core, there are pedestrians everywhere and you really, the thing is, so people inherently change their driving style because by virtue of seeing so many pedestrians on the road, it's a bit of a, a visual cue, if you will. But the reality is, if you want to see that modal shift in the suburbs, people have to take that same mentality when they're driving around the suburbs as well, too. You can't act shocked when you see a pedestrian on a corner or crossing the street somewhere kind of thing. So to your point, it is very much a case of a shared responsibility, and, uh, and we're going to be working very avidly to communicate that moving forward. Thank you. I have a quick question. When you talked about school children, what ages are you talking about there? Yeah, so in the analysis, we basically look at from kindergarten all the way up to grade eight, but we also look at high school age students as well too. So in terms of the schools that we're gonna be targeting, we're gonna be taking both into consideration. Yeah. So you'll be using the same measures around high schools as grade schools? Um, essentially, yes, but again, I, I wanna be a little bit cautious when I say that because each school is kind of unique and the neighborhood's kind of unique. So. It's sort of like we have a tool chest of safety measures, and on a case-by-case -case basis, we'll be working with the schools in terms of what makes the most sense and what's applicable. Yeah. And a lot of that, too, also, when you look at the map, you may have a high school here and a, and a grade school over here in such close proximity that it, it really becomes a bit of a planning exercise for each and every location. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Questions? Are you going to be Allison. evaluating the effectiveness of the various countermeasures? Yes, yes, yep, definitely. That's a very, very key aspect um, to this road safety plan. In fact, one of the things we're doing right now is now that, uh, so I've got a safety planning group within my unit that's basically going through and prioritizing and identifying locations. Our data collection group is now very avidly going out and collecting before data um, for all this. The difficulty, though, as I mentioned beforehand, is how do you go about evaluating this stuff, right? And so this is where we're looking at near-miss analysis, we're looking at speed data, all these types of things, but uh, yeah, thanks, good question. Yeah, please. Um, I don't know exactly what your definition is of serious injuries, but there is a certain risk if you add killed and serious injuries in, in one figure, so to say, and the reason for that is that there's strong evidence that fatalities have different type of factors behind them mm. than serious injury crashes. Uh, if you talk about fatalities, and, and if you carry out in-depth studies, then you figure it out. Yeah. Um, if, you, if you carry out that type of studies, then fatalities are sometimes 50%, something like that, related to excessive behavior. Mm. If you do the same type of analysis for serious injuries, then it's far more low, lower, 10%, mm. meaning that serious injuries are more related to what I call system failures mm. instead of excessive behavior. And I recommend if you carry out some sort of analysis to disentangle that and see whether that's similar in your, in your city. And I have uh, another question to you. Why are you framing uh, motor vehicle crashes as um, aggressive? Um, because if you, if you frame it like that, you don't come so easily on changing the system. And as you know, Vision Zero is very much related to changing the system. If you frame it like aggressive, then you're saying, oh, the only problem is to deal with aggressive drivers. If I eliminate that from the equation, then I don't have the problem anymore. And I believe that's a risky approach. Mm. No, thank you very much for your comments. So uh, if I catch both of these points, um, on your earlier point, so our definition of serious injury is basically um, if the person is taking off to the hospital, the individual. So, uh, with a mate, with a mate. So basically, if the person is able to walk away, that wouldn't be a serious injury. So that's the first piece. In a way, we do kind of take it apart. So going back to your first point, you're 100% right. When you really look at the motor vehicle accident reports in terms of the fatalities versus the serious injuries, the nature of them are fundamentally different. 
Um, the way that we're kind of systematically going through this, though, is we use the KSI map to sort of help us identify, from a priority perspective, which areas we hit first. But once we've boxed off an area and say, okay, we're going to work on that, we pull out all the specific reports pertaining to that area. And we address both the fatalities in terms of things we could do, as well as the serious injuries in terms of the things we can do. And to your point, um, you know, anecdotally speaking, we do get a lot more information from the serious injuries, because those are the things that do kind of generally tend to lead more towards the systematic, uh, systemic, I should say, sort of changes. On the aggressive driving and distraction, and maybe a little bit of a nomenclature thing, and, and again, I agree to your point. I mean, it's, it's not, by calling it aggressive driving, um, you know, by no means do we intend to sort of say, well, it's the, it's the driver's fault, and because it's the driver's fault, there's nothing we can do. Um, much to the contrary, what we're trying to do is hit it on two prongs. Um, one is definitely from an infrastructure perspective, from a traffic calming perspective, we want to implement the safety and countermeasures that, and provide from an engineering perspective the environment and the visual cues that people will naturally drive at the way that we want them to drive through the city kind of thing. So there's a lot being put on that, $80 million of the program. But in parallel with that, from an educational perspective, we felt it's equally as important to really hit home the message to people about aggressive driving, that they realize a lot of people in Toronto think it's everybody else. They don't realize that it's also themselves uh, in this case. And if I can characterize a lot of drivers in Toronto, um, many, many of us are conscientious drivers who don't mean to be, for example, speeding through a side street. And sometimes you need to have those visual cues, like for example, the driver feedback sign, where you know, you're driving and, you know, you know let's, let's talk about distraction for a minute. As many of you know, there's really three different types of distraction, whether it's cognitive, manual, or um, uh, visual, I should say. And, and manual being the one that most people are familiar with, texting on the phone, and a lot of people now have got it in their head not to text on their phone. Um, but the cognitive, where you've got both hands on the wheel and you're looking out the window and you're thinking, you know, what am I going to say in this presentation this morning? I've got a meeting this afternoon, you know. And then subconsciously you don't realize that you're kind of speeding through the area and then you've got these visual cues that kind of bring you back down. It's like, oh my goodness, yeah, I see that driver feedback. So, and the aggressive driving and the messaging towards that is an equal part of it. Um, so I totally agree with your point. Um, it's not to water down or to sort of pass blame, if you will, um, and, and, and literally shirk responsibility in, in that regard. It's really just to hype up uh, from an educational perspective that element of things as well. Yeah, thank you, excellent question.